Hello, welcome to another video. This time we're taking the derivative of inverse secant of x, or we call it arc secant of x. Well, we'll go through the same routine, and at the end of, of the video, I'm going to explain to you why you have to um, make certain notes beside the derivative. Okay, let's get into the video. So remember, the first thing you got to do is rewrite this expression here as if it was equal to y because we really don't know what to do with arc secant or inverse secant. What we know to work with is secant. Okay, so what we're going to say is let y be equal to inverse secant of x. And we know that if we take the secant of both sides, this is what's going to happen. The secant of y is equal to the secant of the inverse secant of x. Do you see that? Now we know this undoes this so that the right hand side becomes x and the left hand side is secant y. Okay, so when we say secant y, we're saying if you take the secant of this angle, you're going to get x over 1. Well, we just write x, but it's actually x over 1. So let's make our uh, triangle here to show what we're saying. So here we've got a triangle and we're going to make this angle y. So what is the secant of y? Secant by definition is 1 over cosine. And what is cosine? Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So secant is hypotenuse over adjacent. So x over 1 is hypotenuse over adjacent. And we can compute this side. Oh, let's do this. So this side here is going to be the square of this minus the square of this, which is the square root of x squared minus 1. So we have, let's make this like this. Okay, so we have this triangle here, and these are the three sides of our triangle. It's important that you sketch this. Maybe I should have sketched it somewhere here. The next thing to do is to take this derivative because that's how we get our answer. So we're going to go here and say that the derivative of both sides, the derivative of secant y, will be equal to the derivative ddx of x. And what is the derivative of secant y? We apply our derivative rule that we know that the derivative of secant is secant y tan y. So it's going to be secant y tan y. And what's the derivative of x? is just 1. So now, there's something wrong. Remember, because you're doing, you're differentiating with respect to x. Yeah, I have to do that once. I can't correct it. Do it once. Do it once. So the derivative of secant y using implicit differentiation is going to be the derivative of secant y, which is secant y tan y multiplied by y prime. Remember, is implicit differentiation because we're differentiating with respect to x. And on the right hand side, if we differentiate with respect to x, we get just 1. So this is what we're looking for, y prime, which is the derivative of this. So our mission is to find y prime. So y prime will be equal to 1 over secant y tan y, which is the same thing as 1 over, let's go to this triangle and find what secant y is and what tan y is. What is secant y? Oh, we already said secant y is x. So I'm just going to write x here. And what is tan y? Tangent is opposite over adjacent. So tan y is just the square root of x squared minus 1. So we're going to write the square root of x squared minus 1. So we can conclude that the derivative ddx of um, inverse secant of x is equal to 1 over x times the square root of x squared minus 1. 
There's a condition. And this is where many people might uh, get confused. Why do we have to do that? What does it mean? Now, let's do two things. Let me start from the easy part and then I go to the, well, everything is easy. But just look at this. Let's go back to this triangle. What is the longest side of this triangle? It is the hypotenuse. And what's the value? It is x. Okay. Now, this is going to clarify your confusion if you're confused about the condition that I'm about to write. And that condition is that whatever value of x you're using must be greater than 1. This is essential when you take the derivative to write it. Why? Because the longest side of this triangle is x. Remember? Now, if the longest side is x, it cannot be 1. It can be 1 if this is 0. That is, if you keep closing this angle until this and this now flatten out and then you get 0, but we still cannot accept x being equal to 1 because it's going to make this derivative undefined. So because when this is 1, you're going to get a 0 in the denominator, so we have to avoid 1 just from this. So 1 is not in the domain. But we want to see, okay, can we use any number less than 1? Can we use 1 half as our input for this derivative? The answer is no, because any value of x you are using has to be greater than 1. Okay, do you see that? x must be greater than 1. Now, this is just from the triangle. But from the actual definition of what secant is, you notice that if we sketch the graph, now this is explanation, so I'm going to draw a line here. I want to explain why the absolute value of x must be greater than 1. So what I'm going to do to explain this is graph the cosine function, graph the secant function, and show you why you cannot have any value of x that is less, that is so close to zero, that the distance of that value from zero is, is less than one. It will not work. And this is the reason. So let's say this is a graph of cosine and we have, so this graph of cosine usually goes like this and you have this, this is for cosine, okay? Cosine x. We know that secant is gonna sit on this. It's gonna sit here. So if I erase the cosine graph, you see, when I raise the cosine graph, I'm going to have this. There's a vertical asymptote at pi over 2. Okay, so I erase this. So you, you see that this is now the graph of secant. There are vertical asymptotes scattered like this, so that this is going to be another one here. So this is not here. So this is the graph of secant, like this. Do you notice that on this graph, there are blank spaces? There is nothing happening here it is impossible for you to get any value of an output here because all the outputs of secant start from 1, which is the maximum value of cosine, is the minimum value up here, minimum positive value of, um, of secant. So you notice that the range of secant, that is all the outputs you're going to get on this graph, the values of y for secant, they start from Let's say they come from negative infinity. So let's say they come from negative infinity, but the maximum you're going to get is the minimum value of cosine, which is negative one. So to negative one. And then you're going to skip all of this gap until you get to one. And then you go to infinity. So as you can see, there is a gap here. And that is the set of all values just after negative one to just before one, and that's how you write it, okay? All numbers, remember that the range of a function is the domain of its inverse. So, because arc secant is the inverse of secant, any value that is not in the range cannot be in the domain, okay? So, what numbers have we just excluded by writing this? We've excluded every value from negative 1 to 1. Can we include, you see, the range includes 1 and negative 1, but we can't use 1 and negative 1 because it will make the derivative undefined. So we left it out. This could have been absolute value is greater than or equal to 1, 
but if you include one, it's going to make this undefined. So that's the only reason we did not include or equal to. So strictly, you have to avoid numbers that are close to zero. They have to go away from zero until they are just after one, and then you can start plugging them in. So don't try to plug in one half. It's not going to work. Obviously, one half squared is going to be one fourth, and one fourth minus one is going to be negative three fourths, which you cannot find a real value for, and therefore your derivative is not real, and that's not what you're doing because this is still real. We're still dealing in the real um, domain of real numbers. So basically, that's the explanation for why you have to have this written. Okay? See you in the next video. Never stop learning. Those who stop learning have stopped living. Bye bye.